great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, at first, I was slightly worried that I wouldn't know what to say because um, you know, studying beyond the cell atlas is a very general thing. It's like referring to zoology as the study of non-elephant animals, basically. And so um, I was a little worried that I wouldn't fit in. But basically, I'm going to tell you the same thing Bill did, except in a slightly, well, quite different context. So it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, what we do in my lab is we compare two things, basically data from brains um, and cognitive, cognitive behavior, and um, results from AI and machine learning. And so our goal is essentially to build neural networks that solve challenging cognitive problems, um, and then um, compare them to um, brain data and make predictions about high throughput data in that way. Um, the most like clear problem that we work on is visual object recognition. So when you look at this scene, you see like a bunch of objects in different places, and you can do that fast and accurately, accurately, effortlessly, even though you've never seen, well, maybe you haven't seen the scene before. Um, and the reason why this works is because a big fraction of your neocortex is devoted to this. In particular, in the ventral pathway of the human and non-human primate, there are these multiple brain areas where they're starting at the retina and then going through a number of different cortical regions such as V1, V2, V4, and finally kind of culminating in the top in this multi-region area called inferior temporal cortex. And this is the brain area that's thought to support this extremely challenging, very computationally intensive behavior of being able to do, recognize what is where at high variability of real world scenes. The way that kind of is thought to work, right, is that data comes in on um, the retina and then is transformed through population represent, re-representations in each of these areas so that by the time it gets to IT at the top, it's able to do um, what we think of as like natural visual behavior. So to put that in context, um, this is data I'm going to just briefly show you from a, uh, an array electrophysiology experiment done by my colleagues um, at MIT. Uh, a number of arrays were implanted in different parts of the visual system, V4 and IT, so kind of toward the top of the ventral pathway. Um, and then one can ask how much information about tasks, such as, for example, is there an animal in the image, or is the boat in the image, or is there a car in the image, whatever, um, can be read out by a linear readout of the neural responses. And so if you do that, what you actually find is that um, neurons in so-called IT cortex or inferior temporal cortex at the top of the ventral stream can do this task pretty well. So this is like 150 such neurons compared to human behavior on those same tasks. This is an eight-way task, so chance is 12.5%. Um, IT is really good. But even though V4, these are neurons just before IT in that ventral pathway, um, are seeing the same images, you can't linearly read out the information particularly well. So some kind of transform has occurred from V4 to IT that's very powerful. And at the time that this data was collected five or six years ago, um, various models of the system, including like the best computer vision models available, um, also couldn't solve this task very well. So both IT and humans were doing something really interesting. And as a result, this sort of made a very clear problem to come up with a predictive model of neural responses throughout this pathway. Right? It's doing something interesting, so how? What is the machinery, the underlying like, computation that's being done there? Right? Um, now, at the time that we started to do this, it was sort of evident that you should probably think about convolutional neural networks, because even though we, since then they've become very big, even back then they had been around for a while. And the reason they were a natural idea to use was because they condensed the rough neuroanatomy of the ventral pathway. They were actually built to do that originally. One, they're hierarchical. They have multiple layers. Two, they're retinotopic or tiled in space. Essentially, that's what convolution is. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of convolutional neural, neural networks here. Many of you may know about this. Essentially, they have individual layers made up of basic operations such as filtering, that's linear, um, filter bank convolution, um, and several other nonlinear operations downstream of those. So this is one layer, and you can think of each of these operations as having kind of neuroscience and data science interpretations. I don't need to tell you about the details, but what it will tell you is that these operations are applied convolutionally. So at the same location, each of the operations is applied the same way at different locations, approximating that retinotopy concept. Right? So if you have image-like input, you get image-like output. And you have one slice of output for each filter pattern you're interested in in the system. Now, you could sort of summarize a whole bunch of visual systems in neuroscience by saying that shallow versions of this type of network, a single layer or some shallow net layer network, um, does a pretty good job of describing neural response properties in V1 cortex. That's early visual system. Right? And the key insight there is to treat these filters, each layer, these little slices, as Gabor filter bank. That is to say, like an edge detector with different frequencies and different orientations. Um, now, 
you might wonder, how did this come from? Where did they get this idea? First, first was they just sort of looked at the data and kind of curve fit it intuitively. Basically, data from Hubel and Weasel and many others um, realized that if you just had a sort of fixed basis set, you could just think about edge detection. It kind of just makes sense intuitively. It actually turns out there's another way to do that, um, which um, is the idea of sparse autoencoding. That is to say, if you have a system that needs to reproduce its output, but do so with as little um, effort as possible um, by reducing the amount of responses needed to do this overall, that if you do this, the filters that arise in that filter bank in the intermediate layer look very much like what's observed in the actual neurons. Right? So um, that's the concept of sparse coding, and that is that neurons have to represent their environment but do so as efficiently as possible. So both of these are good explanations in some way of where this came from. Um, so as a result, it made very natural sense that if you wanted to understand higher parts of the visual cortex downstream, intermediate and later, later parts of the, the system, you would push up having deeper hierarchical networks, right? Because of course, if you have image-like input, you get image-like output. So you can do it again and again and again. You can keep doing this, right? Of course, the problem is there's a lot of parameters, actually a lot more parameters than in the system that we just heard about. First of all, there are architectural parameters like how many layers, number of filters per layer, receptive field sizes, all the architectural stuff. And of course, the filters themselves are continuous valued patterns, and there's a lot of those. Right? So how do you discover the real parameters that actually correspond to cortex? Um, it turns out that you basically can't do either of the methods that I just told you about. They basically both fail for various reasons. It's hard to figure out intuitively what the filters look like at the higher layer. And also, multi-layer sparse autoencoders don't give you things that work particularly well or look like neurons. Um, there's actually an alternative strategy that I'm going to tell you, which is try to fit the neurons to data, much like um, Bill mentioned as one of his options. That also turns out to fail because of overfitting. There's just nothing like enough data that you can collect, even with today's or, or future techniques that we can conceive of, that will give you enough information to fit the parameters of these networks. So what's left? Well, the thing that we just started to do, and which really is basically the same strategy we just heard about, is optimize the network to do the actual task that we think it may need to do behaviorally, and then use that to fit the parameters, and then separately compare to the neural data ex post facto. Okay? So in other words, that's like complementing a kind of standard from below approach, right? Going up through the layers by imposing something on the top and seeing how much of a constraint that makes throughout the system. Right? And so we can talk about what it would, the details, if you want, about how to optimize a network to actually solve this task. Back when we did this, this was a very challenging computer vision problem. Uh, suffice it to say, there was a kind of architectural parameter optimization for the discrete parameters, and then another kind of optimization, um, continuous optimization for the filter parameters. But as a result of that, what came out was a five-layer convolutional network in red here, which is able to do a very good job of solving the task that we saw that humans and IT neurons did, but that other neurons didn't do particularly well, and the previous models of compu from a computational perspective hadn't done. Right? So then you can ask, how well does it actually predict neural responses? Let's start in the top, an inferior temporal cortex. Right? Um, so this is neural responses of a given unit. This is a face neuron. It seems to like pictures of faces more than everything else. This is not time. It's just thousands of responses. That's what the model says it should have. So it's not perfect. Um, this is an R squared of about 0.55. But note, this is on images or, or uh, of a type that it's never seen before. So it's going up and down and about the, the right way. Um, you can look at that across lots of neurons. And if you do, it turns out that the optimal models from a performance perspective are also the ones whose top hidden layer best predicts neural responses um, in the visual system. And this is actually true across thousands of models. So there's some kind of strong correlation here between these things. Um, of course, you can look a little more detailed. If you take an early layer from one of those models, not the one that's actually doing the task, but early on, those don't fit neural responses particularly well. Because while they can capture low variation responses, like the head-on faces, uh, face, um, you know, you know, face-on uh, heads, um, they're actually much worse at predicting what's going to happen when the neuron re remains um, invariant to the fact that the image is changing, but this, um, these, these neuro, uh, the artificial neurons from earlier layers cannot. Um, but if you go up through the layers of the neural network, you're able to retain selectivity for the stimulus type, in this case faces, while um, getting more and more tolerant to variability. Right? And so it's the top hidden layer that predicts neural responses the best, not the actual output layer. That doesn't predict neurons particularly well, but the hidden layer just before the top output. And if you look at that, what that means is as you go through the layers, you get better at predicting this highest part of the neural response area. Um, but we can also look at V4 in the intermediate area um, and look at what the neural responses look like there. Here, they're like really hard to 
say in English what they are, right? It's just ups and downs for lots of images. Um, but if you look at both the top layer and the early layer of the kind of network that I told you about, the predictions are not particularly good. However, at intermediate layers of this network, in this case about 75% of the way through, you get much better predictions, right? So in other words, summarizing this, if you look for predictivity in intermediate area, you get much better um, by looking at intermediate layers of the neural network. And remember, this network is not only not optimized to match neural data, it was only optimized to solve a task. And the thing that was optimized was many layers down or several layers down from these layers. So whatever is happening, there's a very strong constraint on that intermediate structure from solving a task that brings you much closer to being like that neural responses in that particular brain area. Okay, so this is really similar kind of principles to what we just saw, but in a completely different um, type of domain. And in fact, you can continue this analysis down to the earliest layers in early visual cortex. And in fact, if you look at the filters that are learned there, they look pretty much like the filters that you actually observe qualitatively and can characterize by hand in a sense down there. And in fact, these turn out to be the best known explanation of neural response properties in early visual cortex. Better, in fact, than the hand design models that were originally come up with. Right? Um, you know, today, you know, a little bit, a few years later from the work that I just told you, the best models of the visual system are, mo you know, more layers than what I just showed you. There are about 10 visual areas, which corresponds to roughly what you expect from the number of visual areas in, in the human. Um, and then you can do pretty fine-grained distinctions between posterior and anterior neurons or you know, figuring out where they kind of live in the model. Um, and in fact, you can um, <clears throat> figure out that you should also ought to be able to predict intermediate brain areas, subcortically or V2 or perhaps downstream um, from such a structure. And that's an ongoing effort to do that. Um, and in fact, to sort of make the metrics for doing that obvious and natural to everybody and available is, is a key ongoing effort. Um, but let me just talk a little bit about what kind of result this was, right? So this kind of thing where you optimize for the task and compare to neural data is not the form of understanding that is like you pick out what the filters look like by a nice closed form formula like a Gabor wavelet, right? Um, <clears throat> instead, it's like really based on some concept coming out of evolution, right? So nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And sort of in neuroscience, we have a similar idea. Nothing in neuroscience makes sense except in light of behavior. Here we're reformulating that the brain's evolutionary niche can be proxied to some extent by this kind of downstream cognitive task, right? So what's the strategy? What's going on here? Formulate a comprehensive model class. Each dot in this circle is a different model. Um, in this case, convolutional neural networks. Choose a challenging, ethologically valid task, like categorization at high variation, and that forces you down into a subset of these solutions. Maybe there's other solutions for other tasks. Um, and then implement some kind of generic learning rule that gets you to there, right? And then you have a hypothesis for what can actually be compared against neural response data, right? So there's really three ingredients here. There's an architecture class, a loss function, and a data set together sort of comprising a task, and a learning rule. And the learning rule has an evolutionary component, that is to say over the discrete parameters, and a kind of online or developmental component over the continuous parameters. So that idea is something much more general than just vision, right? So in fact, you can actually think about this in other areas, such as audition. You may not be able to see that, but what this says is, well, OK, you didn't hear the audio. But what it would have said is, Hannah is good at compromising. Um, and so because of what the idea that the auditory system is also working along sim similar principles, you can actually do this. That's to say, try to predict auditory recognition tasks and use that to make predictions of neural responses in auditory cortex. And indeed, it turns out, um, with some colleagues, we were able to do this. Here, we actually think of the waveform coming out on the cochlea as represented as this sort of simp kind of image. That's what the cochlea does. Um, and post that, you can stick that into a neural network where you optimize that for challenging auditory tasks, not the same task, of course, as in vision, getting a different network, but then compare to neural data there. And the interesting thing is, is that it turns out that you really want to be looking at multiple different tasks at once with some multiple stream architecture. So in fact, a stream that does some kind of word classification and another kind of stream that does genre classification in sounds. Um, and if you do that, not only do you get by far the best predictions of neural responses throughout auditory cortex, you can actually start to pick apart um, different parts of the brain areas by what type of function, where they live in that uh, pathway organization, either in the early part where there's kind of common representations and downstream where there's function-specific ones. But you know, of course, all of that is specific to the auditory cortex. But what's similar is that if you look at, for each, here, each dot here is a different network, um, word recognition performance versus auditory cortex predictivity 
you see very high correlation. So it's quite a different architecture than with vision, but it's a very similar principle. Right? Um, in fact, you can do a similar analysis in a totally different system. I don't have time to talk about it in great detail. But in rodent barrel cortex, you can also think about this as now a model for haptic processing. Um, of course, you need an input device, which is now much harder to do than in vision. So you have to build an artificial whisker array to do that. And I won't tell you about the details of how to do that. But if you do so, you can look at many different architectures for integrating space and time and then compare to neural responses. Um, and that's an ongoing project um, with some success. And so you know, to, to the extent that this kind of program works, what it's basically saying is, is that uh, there's a kind of broad applicability of this kind of optimization-based approach. So audition, vision, somatic sensation across different species can all be thought of to a, some extent here. Right? And that's, I think, a good uh, situation to be in. Um, but there's some big problems. So uh, each of these ingredients has its own characteristic problems that are really vexing. Okay, so one, um, like everything I've told you about is feed forward models. But actually, the brain has a lot of recurrence and feedback. Why? Okay, two is on the task side, everything I've told you about is le learning using very heavily labeled semantic data. But no organism actually gets that when it learns. Like macaques aren't seeing that kind of like category based labeling, right? Something is really wrong there. Um, and finally, of course, backprop itself is one of these main learning rules is probably biologically implausible in a variety of ways, right? So there's a lot of problems here, and I wouldn't want to gloss over them in my last couple minutes. I'll just talk a little bit about things that are being done to try to address these. Um, so as I say, real neural networks are full of feedback, both local loop recurrence and long-range connections between brain areas. Um, so that suggests that instead of thinking about feed-forward convolutional neural networks, we should be thinking about recurrent convolutional networks, or conv-RNNs, right? Um, there's a lot of details about this, but behavior generated by the dynamics of, of such a recurrent network ought to be able to be useful. Like, for example, um, late dynamics of a neuron detecting an atypical um, face part arrangement, e.g. a prediction error signal, or hard images, those that might have a lot of occlusion or something, being solved by late dynamics. Right? So the dynamics are probably very interesting. Therefore, we should really be using recurrent networks. Um, and recent efforts to build such networks have been um, somewhat successful. So we can actually like, optimize, maybe with in silica evolution, over the class of local recurrent uh, architectures or little local recurrent circuits to solve tasks. And it turns out that if you do so, you can essentially reproduce the power of um, a deep feed-forward network with a network that's shallow enough that it, fits in the, that it would fit in the actual skull, and yet it's recurrent. And so it's using that recurrence to actually make up um, space with time. And then if you take such a network and compare it against the neural response dynamics in neurons, not just the average response on a per stimulus basis, but the you know, 10 millisecond bin, bin um, uh, trajectories, you actually can see pretty good fits there. Um, of course, there's lots of other problems even within this architecture class, such as the fact that um, most of what we know about the brain is actually about neuron arrangement, not necessarily even neuron properties. Right? And everything I've said about neuron arrangement has been totally lost. I mean, uh, neuron arrangement has been totally lost in everything I've said. And so um, I won't have the time to go over this in detail. But what I will say is, is that it is a clear hypothesis that you should think of the spatial arrangement of neurons in the brain um, as representing an optimal solution to sort of extracting good features under general biophysical constraints of reducing the amount of wiring that you would need to achieve that. And if you do this, that is to say, optimize a network to achieve task performance and yet minimize the spatial wiring cost, um, then you can achieve known biological facts about the spatial uh, arrangement, e.g., if you're familiar with these pinwheels in early V1, uh, visual cortex and patches in higher visual cortex with the same structure, right? same kind of wire and cost. Right? So you know, uh, not to say that I've, this has been solved by any means, um, but both issues of recurrence and feedback and also to spatial topography are beginning to be better by recent work. Um, of course, this leaves the big labeled data problem. And there's a lot to be said there. In particular, there's just no way that these creatures receive millions of high-level semantic labels during learning. Right? That's just not what's happening. Right? So you've got to find some kind of self or semi or unsupervised learning loss function that's realistically costly, but nonetheless sufficiently powerful in terms of the representations that it builds. Um, and I mentioned a moment ago that the kind of spatial autoencoders that were so useful at thinking about um, early visual cortex, and in fact, which are um, unsupervised, um, like the one I showed you from sparse autoencoding, um, actually is really quite weak and generally does not produce deep representations that are particularly useful. Right? So there's a big open question of how to do that, um, both for computer vision purposes, for artificial intelligence purposes, and also 
um, for um, models of biology. Um, in the last year, there's been a lot, of a lot of work here, though, and a lot of um, advance. And I would say that the um, solutions that are beginning to arise are ones involving distributions of embeddings of the output. So instead of causing the network to solve um, categorization tasks, that's, that is a reasonable task, but hard to, because it requires so many labels, um, work such as deep cluster and instance recognition have begun to think about the types of distributions of data that should be present um, in a kind of task generic um, output embedding from a neural network, right? And in terms of um, improving this to the point where it can actually solve tasks the way that humans do, um, a technique called local aggregation, which is one that we've been doing, attempts to essentially produce representations or embeddings downstream that figure out how to bring properties together, bring, bring images together when they should, but push them apart when that's more appropriate. Of course, figuring out how to bring them together and push apart is a hard thing to describe in detail um, in such a short time, but there's a way of formalizing that allows the system to learn that in a generic fashion. And it turns out that if you do that, um, the neural networks trained in this unsupervised way are actually even substantially better than some recent deep networks supervised on the task. And so unsupervised learning has begun to really start to make networks um, that solve tasks and moreover, um, predict neural responses. So you know, at this point, we are able to get neural, neural networks that are trained in this unsupervised fashion that I've told you about deep in, in the deep embedding fashion um, that can uh, have both V4 and IT and V1 predictivity better, in fact, than you get from solving a categorization problem. So it begins to make the suggestion um, that we can have sort of accurate unsupervised models of higher brain areas. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of work to be done there and we're sort of just getting toward okay with that one. I'm much less am I going to address the learning rule problem. But I'll just summarize by saying um, these kind of goal-driven neural network models of sensory cortex make qualitative but quantitatively accurate models of these systems across multiple sensory domains. And there's an increasing tightness of the connection between neuroscience and models. So more biologically accurate architectures with recurrence and feedback and spatial topography, and more biologically accurate learning models in terms of how you can do this without requiring huge amounts of supervised labeling. Of course, there's a still a long way to go, but you know, we believe in the sort of tight neuro modeling feedback loop. Uh, thank you to everybody in the group, of course, and um, thanks for the invite. Okay, thanks. Questions? So does the uh, recurrent uh, convolutional neural networks models uh, improves the uh, correlation between the biological data versus the reconstructed uh, data from your neural networks? Or uh, it's, uh, it's not the same comparison? No, it, it is. It, so it doesn't really improve the average. So you can think about what is the biological data. Biological data, you have a neuron, you record its spikes, for each image, you get a different number of spike rate. You take the spike rate and you can, for example, bin it in time between, say, 170 or 100 or roughly milliseconds post-stimulus presentation and 200 milliseconds. That's when the image is actually like penetrated down all those layers. It like, takes about 100 milliseconds. And so you have the spike rate that's on a like, per image, per neuron basis. Right? That's what all the networks that I told you about before the recurrence were compared to. Right? So if you take the recurrent ones, they're not a lot better at predicting the time average responses. But what you can do with the recurrent networks that you cannot do with the feedforward networks is you can compare them to the trajectories of neural responses. Right? So here it's like the response rate binned at a 10 millisecond scale. The spikes are about one millisecond, but the, the spike rate is not reliable at that late. But it is reliable at about the 10 millisecond scale. Right? So if you do like a 10 millisecond bin trajectory, you can ask, OK, if I take the neural network, the convarn in, and I, fit its, I figure out which neuron corresponds to which neuron in the data, you have the, have the convarn and optimize for the task, all its parameters have been fit. No data has needed to do that. Now you take the convarn in and you ask which neuron here corresponds to which neuron in the data, and you map it. Then you can ask, OK, I've done that across all that with like using the average of the data, the temporal average, to make the map. Does the trajectory of responses over time that the neuron produces look like the actual trajectory of responses in the real neuron? And that's what, what it is much better at. Right? I have another small question. So if you're not uh, doing like a training from end to end, from image to behavior, you take some real, very noisy biological data. And you, you input it as your as your input for your neural networks. Uh, can you uh, like after taking into account the biological noise? Can you like reconstruct a later uh, like a IT ne uh, neural response from your neural networks? Um, 
this is basically the strategy that I mentioned as like curve fitting the neural data as opposed to optimization, like an ecological optimization principle. Bill also mentioned it as one of the options. In practice, the answer is no. Even though you would expect optimizing for the data to give you better models than like this like high level principle, it's, it's the opposite. Why? Because you have a lot of parameters to fit and you have a little data. And so what ends up happening typically when you do that kind of, that kind of thing is severe overfitting. You fit to the neural data on half the images and you check on the other half and the model bombs, right? But the behavior, the end-to-end -end, like evolutionarily posited principle, oh, you know, this network is solving vision, right? The task, right? You can get a lot of, quote, data for that. Just images and their responses or whatever. We, like there's a lot of, it's easy to build up data. So in a way, practically speaking, the thing that is the theory ends up being easier to actually optimize for and get good models because you can, you know how to make it not overfit. You know what the actual target is, right? So if we had like tw two orders of magnitude more neural data, we could probably produce better models by curve fitting. Of course, maybe that would be better from a practical point of view because then we could like use the models to do more detailed connections. Um, to the data, but it would be less satisfying from an intellectual point of view because you wouldn't know why the neurons were the way they were, you would just have fit them, right? This is not that, it is not a curve fit, right? There's an underlying ecological principle here. Maybe uh, uh, one more thing to say about that is that um, even though these models have not been optimized to match the data, they've simply been optimized to solve the task, if you do this mapping procedure, you can actually make predictions about which images drive the neurons strongly. In fact, um, recently my colleagues, Jim DiCarlo, et cetera, have published a, a paper about this and others have, have carried this forward. You can get um, like predictions of what the optimal stimuli are for a given neuron way better than by like screening natural images through such predictive models, right? So even though the model was not met, fit to match the data, it actually allows us to like drive the neurons in actual practice really strongly toward given response patterns or desired response patterns. So, would that get better if we could fit the neurons to the data? If we had enough data to prevent overfitting? Perhaps. But it's, you know, in practice, the theory is very useful in a sense. Yeah. Le leaving away the, the, the whole theory part on vision and so on, I think it's an interesting problem by itself to essentially get better, let's say, for image classification, image net, or something like that. So your local aggregation method and, and the others, what, what was exactly the contribution? Were you able to really learn without any labels? Yeah. Surely this is what an alt encoder can do, but it doesn't do it deeply? No, no. Or did it's, you it's still it's have to use some labels no, or was right. it more efficient? You can, this is a completely unsupervised procedure. I could get into the details. Basically what it's doing is like computing two types of neighbors for each point. I, I I, so it's like metric learning, right? But I, I don't want to have the details. Bit. You're just saying you get s state of the art features as you would get with a supervised uh, image network. Yeah, so here's the, the exact result. Um, of course you do less well than the supervised thing when you transfer the unsupervised thing to, to um, supervised data, because it doesn't, doesn't have a lot of labels. But um, you do pretty close. And close in two, I'll measure that in two ways. One of them is sort of arbitrary but still powerful. Over 12, three or four years ago, the state of the arts unsupervised network, sorry, supervised networks, these networks, Beat those, okay? So they're much, they're like really high performance from a from a practical standpoint. Not as good as the absolute like like thing supervised with three and a half billion labels with a thousand layers. For, okay. Not as good as that, but close enough that not only do you outperform when the unsupervised thing is something that was supervised a few years ago, but actually, as I say, they match the neural data, right? So you're in the game, right? You can actually say these are this these unsupervised networks are good enough. You can actually use them as a model for real neurons which was very far from being the case until recently. Okay, and with that, let's uh, thank Dan again and get ready for the lightning talks.